going to take you to the second discourse because it's more important. The first was just a short essay. And the second discourse is a more complex argument. It's much of the same thing, but with more detail and more important conclusions. So let's just look at the uh, discourse on the origins of inequality. So it's 1755. There's a couple of years that go in between. And then he writes the new uh, discourse. He also wins a prize for this. It's published. And it becomes a major success for him. And also in classes, if you ever wanted to give your students a Rousseau uh, discourse to read, this would be the one to get. And it's easily available. All kinds of publishers have it. So the question of the essay was, where does, where do the, where does inequality come from in, in human life? How did it come about? And what, why did it happen? First of all, here's his opening. I dared to strip man's nature naked to follow the evolution of those times and things which have disfigured him. I compared man-made with natural man, I discovered that his supposed improvement had generated all his misery. So there you are, right back to the argument of the previous discourse. So he starts out by admitting that, yes, of course, there are two kinds of inequality. One is the natural inequality. The taller man can probably beat up the little shorter, thinner man. So that, that we all, but it's the other kind. It's the, his job is to explain the, the social inequality. How did this come about? And so he explores man by going back to the beginnings, to, to working out a theory about what human beings are like and what they were like in the primitive world. So in a sense, this is early anthropology. And most anthropology departments and archaeology departments will give Rousseau the credit for being the founder of both those fields, just because he does this. He does this. He didn't go out into the field, of course, but he wrote about it and he said, okay, this is how human beings started. So we evolved uh, from a primitive biped and we evolved and uh, he knows he's not the first to raise all this. He knows Hobbes wrote about it, Locke, uh, Locke wrote about it. So Rousseau sees natural man as healthy and at peace. And so here's a very famous paragraph. I see him feasting under an oak drinking at the first stream, making his bed at the foot of the same oak tree which has furnished his meal, and this his needs, and thus his needs are satisfied. I see him feasting under an oak tree drinking the first stream. It's a nice dream, but as someone who actually has an oak, uh, I, I, I question how useful those acorns are. Now, natural man, he says, in nature, um, is healthy because he eats a healthy diet, he has healthy exercise, instead of being fat and indolent like the Frenchmen are in 1750. Of course this was true. Natural man endures bad weather, tough conditions, so he's tough and healthy, and of course Parisia, Paris and France was going to hell. Natural man lives close to nature, special in nature more than just a beast. He has freedom, he has all kinds of freedom, so that man in the original state of nature, he's not in families, so he denies a basic key idea of, of Aristotle, Hobbes, Locke, everybody before him. Uh, so he's throwing out some kind of natural social person as part of our core. He's going to uh, throw away two key things, the Bible, man's not a sinner, and Aristotle and the Greeks, man is not a social animal, man can be out in the forest on his own, be perfectly happy, you can all see how a man who lives in a hotel shacking up with his maid yeah. and sending his kids to an orphanage the minute they're born would have these theories about, about general human nature and, and how he might get it a little bit wrong. <laughs> Diderot got it right. Rousseau got it wrong. Diderot got it right. So then the next stage of man's condition is nascent society in which he acquires huts and a feeling of property and family. Now he settles down with a female partner. Man in this stage enjoys a natural pity, natural compassion, but he's leaving behind his pure condition, his, his natural condition, and now he becomes jealous because he's got this lady, so he's jealous, and um, he becomes social and linguistically active. Uh, but in the new uh, developed communities uh, comes inequality, a social, civilized inequality, social inequality. He, he who sang or danced the best, he who was the most handsome, the strongest, the most adroit, the most eloquent, became the most esteemed. And the develop mark, uh, development marked the first step toward inequality and at the same time, vice. 
of course, there's the beginning. That's how society. So the social man now finds inequality and eventually war. So at this stage, Rousseau's man of the man uh, resembles Hobbes' state of war. Uh, for Rousseau, man enjoyed earlier natural peace, whereas Hobbes sees men falling naturally into war. Uh, the tragedy of man is that he can no longer find happiness in the only way it can be found, that is living in nature, in accordance to nature. Natural man enjoys repose and freedom. Natural man is content to idle. You can imagine how 17-year-olds reading this mm -hmm. would pack up their sleeping bags and their camp stoves and head to Oregon. The tragedy of man is he can no longer find happiness back in nature. Civilized man is always active, always working, uh, sometimes bowing to greater men who he hates, richer men who he hates, so it's not good. Now, of course, we come back to the property. A uh, key part of the Rousseauist critique of civilization was property. Uh, human beings should not be putting fences about property. They shouldn't have property. They shouldn't care about how property. They shouldn't want property. They're much better, much better off if they're out in the forests and they've got the oak trees and the acorns and, and, their, and their wives and their kids and they don't have to worry about what they own. They don't have to worry about their mortgage. They don't have to worry about taxes. Uh, Voltaire, on the other hand, thought this was ridiculous. Voltaire loved his property and spent a lot of money on his property and spent a lot of money on the village that he owned that was part of his property. He built buildings. He bettered the condition of the peasants in his town, raised it up by teaching it uh, crafts, and turned his village into an immensely prosperous town that is now still going and is a big, big, huge success and everybody's driving Mercedes. So, you know. Who did better, <laughs> Voltaire or Rousseau? Tesla. Yeah, yes, Teslas were what, what Rousseau has. Rousseau has his town full of Teslas. Voltaire wrote in the margin of Rousseau's statement that first man to enclose land was the founder of both a civil society, quote, voila, the philosophy of a beggar who <laughs> would have the rich be robbed by the poor. How do you like that? Isn't that great? Uh, one key thing in this, in terms of critique is across the channel in England, Jean Locke and his disciples were writing a theory of government that was exactly the opposite of this. Locke and the British tradition pointed out that from the Magna Carta, 1215, the protection of freedom was in the protection of property. It was the protection of property that enabled all those folks in the Magna Carta to protect their own freedom. And as long as governments insist on protecting property, the freedom of the citizen will also be protected. So, so you can contrast Rousseau with John Locke. If you want a great book about all this, get Richard Pipes, P-I-P-E-S, Harvard professor. This is the key book, the best book anybody's written about property and freedom. And that's what it's about. He explains that it's the British who figured this out way, way back and have worked century after century after century after century uh, to enshrine in a Bill of Rights, which of course all those British col colonialists carried over to the United States of America and enshrined in their own constitution. So, so Rousseau versus Locke. Uh, and here's Voltaire's comment that I read to you before. I received most of your new book against the human race and I thank you. No one has employed so much intelligence to turn us men into beasts. One starts wanting to walk on all fours after reading your book. However, in more than 60 years, I've lost the habit. <laughs> and so that's the second discourse. Now, what we need to realize is that Rousseau is romanticism and romanticism is the most powerful force unleashed on Europe in 1750 that there ever was going to be and it was going to sweep through and keep going and going and going and a key part of it are all these people, every single person on the screen, Byron, Goethe, Casanova, Chopin, Franz Liszt, Napoleon, Beethoven, Alfieri in Italy, every single one of those people are romantic writers and thinkers and they're also revolutionaries. They're all revolutionaries. And what unified the whole romantic program was their dedication to freedom. 
And this dedication to freedom was inherently revolutionary if you think of it coming from Paris in 1750. Of course it was revolutionary. And everybody knew it. Everybody saw it. Everybody realized it was revolutionary. Every French official knew what Rousseau was saying. And certainly the king and queen of France knew, and so did everybody else. The entire romantic program of human liberty and freedom unifies all these people that you just saw. Rousseau, Goethe, Byron, Shelley, Benjamin Franklin, Thomas Jefferson, Thomas Paine, uh, Lafayette, every single one of those individuals dedicated to freedom, dedicated to romanticism, are also dedicated to revolution. One of the great examples of the intersection between Rousseau, Paris, his writings, and revolution is Benjamin Franklin. Here's the wonderful portrait of Benjamin Franklin, and you can see uh, here's the romantic guy from the frontiersman, the man who's come in from the woods in America, in Paris, the American representative in Paris, socializing with the king and queen all the time. And he stands for freedom and the United States of America and the revolution of 1776. Remember, it's the American Revolution that comes first. It's the American Revolution that feeds the French Revolution. It's the American Revolution that is a romantic revolution. The new world, the frontier, natural man, all the different aspects are all summed up in Benjamin Franklin and all these other romantic leaders and thinkers. A great example is Byron in Greece. Byron goes to Greece in 1821 and leads the Greek Revolution. The Greeks are trying to overthrow the Turks. They're trying to get their independence. They will succeed. And Byron and all the fancy people in London want to help them. And Byron heads up the Liberation of Greece Committee. And they place ads in the London Times and they solicit money and they get lots of money. And they send the money to Byron. In Italy, he buys guns. He loads the guns into ships. He takes the ships to Greece and he dies in the Greek Revolution and becomes the most celebrated foreigner in Greece to this day. To this day, statues of Byron are all over Greece. So there's another example of revolution, romanticism, and the new age. And everybody knew Rousseau was predicting revolution. And the American Revolution of 1776 French Revolution of 1789. And everything that swirls around Rousseau's writings and thoughts uh, alert everybody to the, to the danger that the government faces, that the king and queen, its detachment from the, from the citizens of France, everybody understands. And when they publish their Declaration of Rights, it's pure Rousseau. Look at the first clause. Men are born and remain equal before the law. Natural man. Natural man is the core piece of the French Revolution. So, so that's the story of the most influential man of 18th century France. Voltaire is angry at me for saying that. <laughs> he, he would like to think he was the most influential man. Fortunately, they're buried together in the Pantheon so they can argue to eternity. <laughs>